All right, folks, it's Dr. Rob Sivers, and today I've got kind of an entertaining thought. You know, when I walk my dog dog in the morning, I'm looking at the, the moon, the phase of the moon, it's dark outside, and my head begins to spin, and it's a beautiful, relaxed state where things just bubble up in my head. And the thing that bubbled up this morning was this. Um, when did we human beings start eating plants? When did we start eating plants? Interesting. Okay, so... I don't want to clash with religious and, and biology, genetic uh, evolution folks, but I'm going to take the perspective of evolution for, the, for this part of this discussion. As far as we understand it, we evolved from a common primate ancestor that was more plant-based, leafy plant-based, than meat-based. And there are a few animals out there like gorillas and that kind of thing that still eat predominantly plants, will are omnivores. Um, in fact, the interesting statistic, uh, think about this. Chimpanzees are one of our closest relatives in the modern world. Obviously, we've uh, evolved through multiple different uh, uh, species changes to become Homo sapiens and now <laughs> Homo carbosauruses. But... Um, what is the genetic difference? If you do a human genome and you do a chimpanzee genome, how much different are we actually genetically? Do you have an idea? My understanding and my reading tells me that it's less than 1%. Less than 1% genetic difference between being a chimpanzee and being a human. So there's so much that is similar. And the question then is, why? when did we start eating plants again? Because what we did is we went from being mostly a plant-based uh, um, animal, and we've got parts of our intestinal tract that speak to that. But what's happened with our intestinal tract is our small intestine has lengthened. We've got the longest small intestine in the mammalian kingdom. And one of the smallest stomachs, we've got a tiny, tiny stomach relative to other animals that eat plants. And our colon has lost all function, has lost all absorptive and secretive function except for salt and water. In fact, the only part of my body that still is a remnant of our primate ancestors, our vegetarian primate ancestors, is my appendix. Oh yeah, and that's in a bucket somewhere. Somebody took it out. I'll just, <laughs> as a little segue, folks, um, uh, and this is just an entertaining story because I'm, I'm entertaining right now, but we'll come back to the when do we start eating plants in a second. But I was in, at the University of Michigan, I was a pediatric surgery fellow, and I was about, well, it was a long time ago, and I just finished this really long case, and I felt like crap through the case. Felt awful. I was sick as a dog. Had abdominal pain and everything. And my senior, senior fellow was a guy called Jonathan Greenfeld. Good guy. Um, he's a pediatric surgeon in, in Arizona now. And I went back to the fellow's uh, sleeping room because we were on 48 hours, uh, every, every 24 hours. So uh, we spent a lot of time in the hospital. Lay down on the bed and said, dude, man, my, my belly's hurting. And he pushed on my belly and he said, you got, you got appendicitis. We got to look inside your belly. And it was interesting is that one of the things I brought to the University of Michigan um, in the, in the uh, mid-90s was a high level of experience with laparoscopic surgery, which is the keyhole surgery, which I got developed in, in, from my Canadian training in, at Toronto, where a lot of the Montreal guys trained me. That's a little bit too much history, but I was a, the, one of the first generation laparoscopically focused, laparoscopically comfortable patients or, or, or doctors. So I just spent many hours taking out a child's entire colon for, mil for familial polyposis laparoscopically. They take me to the OR, they turn the room around, they stick me on the bed, same bed I ju was just operating on, OR table, and nobody can do the surgery laparoscopically. So they cut me open. It was, it's the last open appendix I've been present for, which was my own. I was asleep, they cut me open to take out my appendix. And this is the mid-90s. Be that as it may... <laughs> Take out my appendix, great operation. They, uh, in fact, I, that was about 11 o'clock at night, 
At 5 a.m. the next morning, I actually walked home because they'd taken my wallet and everything else away from me, wanted me to stay in the hospital, took out my IV, wrote my own discharge instructions and, and walked home through a snowstorm. Uh, it is literally a true story. However, here's the funny part. We were talking about the colon and this reminded me of my appendix. I read my operative note and Jonathan Greenfeld, who is a good friend of mine, and this is in days we could still do this. And this is in the medical record at Mott Children's Hospital at the University of Michigan. My operative note stated that um, after the patient was positioned and prepped, uh, we made a skin incision, entered the abdomen uneventfully, and identified the patient's colon. We carefully palpated the colon and came across the skeletons of multiple small animals that turned out to be gerbils. That is in my operative note, okay? Okay, and then it goes on to describe the appendix. So the the point of that story is, and I didn't have gerbils in my colon, I promise you. That was at a time when Richard Gere was accused of certain uh, sexual malpractices and um, or dysfunctional practices, in my opinion. But be that as it may, uh, that was just a funny, funny quote from my uh, um, past. And the reason I know that it would have had to have been intact gerbils not gerbil skeletons, is because the colon does not have the capacity in humans to process anything other than salt and water. So the human colon can absorb or excrete salt and water. It has no capacity to absorb anything else. So when plants reach the colon, when fat reach the co reaches the colon, there's an esterification process for fat with bile, that makes your poop brown, and there's a fermentation process that happens with the bacteria in your colon that turn plants to poop. But there is no nutritional absorption or secretion other than salt and water. So we've lost that capacity in the colon. In the stomach, there's no plant-based absorptive churning or absorptive function. The, stomach acid, the human stomach acidifies plants and churns them up into chyle, but it doesn't have any absorptive or other bacterial function. In fact, the, the stomach should be sterile. It's the small intestine where all our work gets done and it's enzymatic. So we are designed and over a course of moving away from primates to have a small intestine that is enzymatic in function and prefers, prefers animal products. Now, as we grew to be human, particularly because of our brain, we mostly existed on shorelines, lake shorelines, uh, seashore lines. And on the shorelines, a large dominant part of our food supply came from marine animals and algae and that kind of thing, but marine plants, marine animals. And that's why we need that DHA that, and the, the types of fat that come from fish and seafood and shellfish. So we were dominant there. We also ate the animals that came down to drink at that water. Guess what? There's no plants. So when we were hunter-gatherers, all hunter-gatherer populations still do not only eat, do not only eat carnivore. We're scavengers. So from a subsistence perspective, all humans, all human species will find reliable sources of carbohydrate as a staple, as a supplement for our diet. The Eskimos will harvest berries. They'll harvest high uh, uh, carbohydrate containing fruit and dry that, eat that and dry that, but that's seasonal. So there is a supply of fruit. Most of the center of the earth, the equatorial hunter-gatherer folks, those that live not in icy climates like the, uh, like the Inuit, um, will dig up roots and tubers. They'll find starchy plants buried, buried in the ground, the roots and tubers, and they will gather um, fruits and high carbohydrate products. When you go back to nature, leafy plants and grains look and are and taste pathetic. They have almost no nutritional value. So while opportunistically we may use them, we use them more medicinally than nutritionally. Plants were not a big part of our diet because our intestine tells us that we didn't eat them. We evolve according to what we eat. We evolve our intestine according to what does best for us, what we have access to over thousands of years. So 
The human intestine is not geared toward plants, so we've never really, for a large block of our species, from when we left the jungles, from when we left our vegetarian primate ancestors, to very recently, we have not eaten plants. We've eaten tubers and berries, and we've eaten fruit, and we've eaten fibrous carbohydrates. Why? We chewed them. That's why we needed strong musculature. Australopithecus had these massive jaw muscles, our precursors. So we chewed meat, we chewed animal products, and we chewed fibrous fruit, uh, fibrous, fibrous uh, tubers, and we, we made pulp out of them. But we were starch-based, and the simple sugars came at best from fruit and honey and that kind of thing. We never ate fruit, uh, ate, ate plants. We never ate the seeds of plants in abundance. Because if you look at the rudimentary ones, and you can Google this, you see where, where the seeds of plants, the grain products came from. They were pathetic. They were grasses. And we lost the capacity to consume grass, and we've never regained that capacity. But as we existed around shorelines, we found that we had water, we had arable land, and in the very, very recent human experience, in the very recent, ex uh, think Mendel, who was a monk, who played around with peas. That's where genetics really started, or DNA uh, um, hybridization. So in the very recent past, maybe only over the last thousand years or so, maybe a little bit longer, did we begin to hybridize, to hybridize leafy plants and plants that had seeds, above ground plants, very, very recently, because we never ate grasses. Modern humans did not eat grasses. So we learned to hybridize grasses, above ground plants, and that provided for us food security. We could grow our own. We could carry those seeds with us. We could eat them or sow them when we went on our travels. And we could store them. So it enhanced our survival prospects when we learned agriculture. But think about this, folks. If the use of plants is very recent, only the last couple of thousand years in the human experience, then clearly our intestine had evolved away from them. And we know that by the biology of the intestine. So therefore, they were a source, plants were a source of food security, not a biologic necessity. And yes, we could extract the carbohydrates from starchy plants. But leafy plants, our colon didn't need them, our stomach didn't need them. We have very, very little need for leafy plants, lettuce, kale, what the hell are you supposed to do with that? Chew cardboard. It, it doesn't make biologic sense that we need leafy plants as a species. We've moved away from them. Now, we've recreated them, but plants protect their seeds more than anything else because that is the future of their species. So they've got a whole bunch of toxic things because those seeds can't really run away. So they've got toxic things to mammals. And plants, those, the seeds of plants are not very good for the human intestine. Celiac disease, autoimmune disease. Yes, we can extract some fundamental carbohydrates from them as a source of survival, but we no longer need them. So just an interesting question when I was with my dog. Why do we need plants? When did we start eating so many plants? When did we start eating lettuce? Who the hell looked at a little green thing on the ground and said, mm, that must be tasty? doesn't make logical sense. So this whole push toward an above-ground leafy plant diet that is so healthy for humans is contrary to logic, contrary to biology, contrary to evolution. Ask yourself that question. Do some thinking. It's logical. Do some backward thinking. And next time you're walking in nature, look at the fields, look at the grasses, and see, ask yourself, would you eat that? Ask yourself, would you eat that? No, you would not. Everything that we eat that is plant-based has been hybridized. Has been hybridized. From the fruits to the nuts, uh, to the seeds, to the grains, to the plants themselves. Very, very little is natural. Now, you could say the same about the animals. You could say the same about the animals. 
But the animals are a hell of a lot closer to what we ate in nature, what we found in nature. The plants are a world, a dystopian world away from what we had access to before we became farmers. And we have not been farmers for very long. Hmm. Interesting. Think it through. Think it through. Yes, they added benefit. Yes, they added stability. Yes, they added added nutrition. And now they're adding disease. And now they're adding disease. Now they're adding disease. If I've made you think, throw your comments at me, yell and scream and shout at me. Wow, I never thought of it that way. Those are great comments. Troll me. Hit the like, hit the dislike button. But think, 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 think. If I'm giving you ideas, if I'm giving you something to think about the next time you walk your dog, or if I'm giving you a reason to take your dog for a walk, or have a fight with your vegetarian friends, Lovely, lovely, lovely little battles. Because their brains fatigue so quickly. <laughs> I said that. Um, actually, that was one of the gerbils in my colon speaking. I will see you next time, folks. Sometimes I like levity. Sometimes I like just to blow my own mind. It's small, so it gets blown very easily. I'll talk to you next time. I am the Carb Addiction Duck.